Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, um, to today's event. Um, today's event has been organized by the Belief and Reason Society, and we would like to actually thank all of our attendees for coming down actually today. Um, today's program and our event today has been, organ um, has been organized by the Belief and Reason Society, as we mentioned, and we in the Belief and Reason Society believe that ideas that are held onto by people, groups, societies, and the world at large needs to be based on reason and rationality. In the light of recent events that have been taking place in Western civilization, with the development of science and technology, the discussion of rationality has been brought to the forefront of discussion. Many people have argued that their values and their ideas are based on rationality and accused their opponents of their arguments being not based on reason or not being based on the principles of rationality. <coughs> So this has actually fundamentally led us to our event and debate today, the proof of God, with the motion being, is the belief in a creator rational? Historical discussions on this topic have actually led to hurdles and stagnation, leading people to concern ideas about this topic. For example, many people say that the coming of the belief to, in a God is a journey in itself, while other people have simply relegated this topic to the temporal and many, many have n neglected this discussion at full stop. So, <coughs> in our discussion today, we'd like to actually get to the crux of the discussion of this matter and actually try to get past these hurdles that have been set down in re recent discussions. So today, we have concluded in this debate, and our debate will be on the proof of God, is the belief in a creator rational? While advertising for this event, the Belief and Reason Society actually went out and was handing out leaflets <coughs> and questionnaires to many of the students at SOAS. And today we have actually conjured up um, some results that we would actually like to share with you. So without further ado, I would like to invite the President of the Belief and Reason Society, um, Nafis Ahmed, to come and give a very short presentation on the results that we found. So without further ado, Nafis <coughs> Ahmed. Um, thanks very much. Uh, like Rupan mentioned, that we have been um, handing out questionnaires and basically engaging with the students of SOAS regarding their beliefs and the reasons behind the beliefs that they hold. To show you some of the uh, things we've been asking them. Um, first of all, for example, uh, this has been that should there be an absolute freedom of speech? And you can see the results from the, uh, what the students of SOAS believe. Uh, over 50% said yes, absolutely. So they've been saying that absolute freedom of speech, so for example, freedom to slander, freedom to even criticize or mock religions. And they said that because this freedom of speech is such an important notion in society, we, there should be some, you know, even collateral uh, damage, so to speak, in terms of, okay, I may accidentally slander you, I may accidentally mock your religion, but this is a consequence that we must accept in catering for the freedom. Whereas others, almost 30% they said no, freedom of speech should be limited uh, when it comes to certain things, so such as uh, the tabloids and you know, gossips and you know, slandering and libel, these kind of things should be limited and should not be allowed in society. Uh, almost 20% said that they were not sure on how they would decide. The other question had been uh, regarding capital punishment, very controversial, and we can see regarding this has been complete opposite. Over 50% said absolutely no, no capital punishment under any, in any uh, circumstances. Almost 20% said yes, but I think very interestingly, almost 30 said they were not sure. So, and if you actually add the not sure and the people who said yes, they, all, they are almost equal to the people who said no. So, um, we were discussing these issues with them and we were engaging the students as to why they held certain beliefs and they gave many reasons. One of the other uh, questions, and perhaps even more controversially, has been should euthanizing disabled infants be legal? Uh, as you can see, almost 70% of people said no and 30% of people said yes. And when we were discussing with the students, a lot of the time they, we, we realized that the basis of their morality or their judgment came down to whether uh, you know, where they felt morality should come from. So some people said, look, morality should come from God, and almost, as you can see, 15% uh, on so said God should be the only source of morality. Others said it should come from society, and over 50%, whereas the others, uh, even just over 10%, said God plus another source should be the basis of morality. Um, some other comments they said, 
uh, for example, that law should come from you know, a mixture of all sources, law should be conscientious, and so on. So we felt that today's discussion was very important because um, if people did feel, feel that their um, morality should come from God, then the question is that God exists. And if this is a you know, very problematic view, then surely their morality should not come from it. But on the other side, for the people who said that their morality, morality should come from society, if it is true that God does exist, then surely God is the objective source of morality and society is not. So I think it all backs, comes down to uh, the debate we're having today. Um, lastly, I'd just like to show you the census of 2001 of England and Wales. Almost 80% of the population professed to have some kind of religion, um, whether it was Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, or Islam. Um, almost 15% said they had no religion, or uh, otherwise known as atheism, and just slightly less than 10% said that they didn't want to state whether they had a religion or not. So I think this is why one of the reasons why we are having this debate today to um, put an end to the discussion, so to speak, so whether the belief in a God is rational or is it something that is only in the, in the realms of faith, leaps of faith, so uh, as people like to say. But we want to actually bring it onto the perspective of rationality because we want to have discussion regarding it. Uh, whereas if it's regarding faith and blind faith, then you can't really engage in that topic. Um, so. Uh, coming back to the discussion today, uh, we have uh, two guests with us, and uh, uh, Rupan will do the introduction for them. And um, as you can see, the motion is his belief in a creator rational. So, uh, Rupan. Um, our panelists today, um, as you can see, include Professor Richard Norman, Emeritus Professor and an ex-lecturer at the University of Kent. Professor Richard Norman is now currently one of the many vice presidents of the British Humanist Association and has been active in this field for quite some time. Our second guest is Hassan Chowdhury to the far left, an Islam channel presenter and author of the forthcoming book, God's ID. He has participated in many debates in the field of religion and identity. His last debate being on proof of God, the same debate at Imperial University with Professor Peter Atkins from the University of Oxford. Our program today will consist of firstly a 15 minute presentation by both speakers on the topic of proof of God, prepare, presenting their specific viewpoints. <laughs> Professor Richard Norman will present first against the motion, followed by Hassan Chowdhury who will be for the motion. Then both of our guests will have five minutes to come with a rebuttal. We ask both of our speakers to stay on topic and more importantly to keep to the time limit we have imposed on them. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Richard Norman. There's nothing more unnerving than being told that you've got to keep to the time limit. But thank you very much for that introduction, and I'm very pleased to be invited to, to speak to you today. <coughs> Particularly pleased in the light of um, what your officers have said about the, the aims of this society, because as they have said, the topic that we're debating today <laughs> is one that, of course, has been debated down the centuries, but has been especially uh, in people's minds and, uh, and discussed a great deal in the last few years for various reasons. And, of course, an extremely controversial topic, and one on which people have very, very strong feelings, and on, on topics on which people uh, uh, disagree and on which they feel strongly, there's always a big danger of misunderstandings and of people failing to appreciate what one another's position is. And that's why it's so important and why I so much want to echo what, what your officers have said about the importance of uh, rationality and rational debate and argument. Because um, you, even if that rational debate leaves us with our views unchanged, that what it, the very least that it can do is help us to understand better other people's positions. And I think that's really vital for a debate like this. And that's why I'm so pleased to, to have been invited to talk to you today. Now, I said that um, this is a, a, our question today is one that's been discussed a great deal um, over the last few years. And one of the main things that, that, that sparked off renewed discussion of this um, was a spate of books by people sometimes referred to as the New Atheists. And the most famous of these was Richard Dawkins and his, <coughs> his book, The God Delusion, which was published a few years ago. And since he published that book, there's been a whole spate of responses to it. 
um, from, from religious writers trying to answer his arguments and make a rational case <coughs> for a religious belief and for, for belief in the existence of a God. Uh, and what I want to do now is to just look quickly <coughs> in the time we've got at two particular arguments which have very frequently been uh, employed by the defenders of religious belief uh, in response to Dawkins and other people. The first of these is to appeal to evidence from modern science. Now, in a sense, religious believers who appeal to the argument from modern science, um, you might think are on dangerous ground. Dawkins, of course, is a scientist, and Dawkins takes the view that modern science completely disproves uh, any belief in the existence of a god. Uh, uh, and if you look at the, the issue over a long historical perspective, it seems to me there's, there's really no doubt that over the centuries, over the past thousand years or so, the growth of scientific understanding has gone hand in hand with, and I would say is a, a fundamental explanation of, the decline of religious belief. Uh, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, it was commonplace for people to explain unpredictable phenomena by, in, in terms of the intervention of gods and goddesses. Why, why is there thunder and lightning? Why do floods occur? Why are there earthquakes? It must be because the gods are angry, or the god, god is angry with us. Or, again, why do certain natural phenomena um, uh, demonstrate order and predictability and regularity? Why does the sun always move in the same course in the sky? Why do the stars revolve as they do? Uh, and again, in the absence of any explanation, people have uh, uh, in, in the past appealed to uh, the intervention of a divine creator to, uh, to achieve that order and regularity. Or again, of course, why is it that um, living organisms are so wonderfully and complexly constructed and so beautifully adapted to their environment? Uh, and, and, and the explanation that many people favoured was, well, um, it's because God has God has made God has, has produced these finely constructed organisms to, to fit into their environment. But as exp scientific explanations have more and more become available for all of these phenomena, uh, for the movements of the heavenly bodies, for the existence of living things, for the construction of living things, the emergence of species with evolutionary theory and so on. So, uh, by step after step. <coughs> the appeal to divine intervention has been pushed to the margins. And I think there's no doubt that historically scientific explanations now massively play the role that religious explanations used to play in explaining natural phenomena, the existence of living things and so on. Nevertheless, as I say, many, many modern defenders of religious belief, particularly in response to Dawkins, have appealed to modern science and in particular have appealed to um, what's, what seems to have become a very popular argument, which is often referred to as the fine-tuning argument. You, many of you may already be familiar with this, but I just briefly want to explain what that argument is. The way in which it goes is this. Well, okay, scientific explanations can explain all those particular phenomena, uh, uh, um, the movements of, of inanimate objects, the existence of life, the emergence of different species, uh, but all those explanations ultimately have to be traced back to the one inexplicable event, which is what scientists call the Big Bang. Uh, and it's not just the, the, the Big Bang, the, the origins of the universe billions upon billions of years ago. It's not just that event needs explaining, but so the argument goes. What has to be explained is how the initial conditions for the origin of the universe were just right to produce our universe as the kind of universe that it is. <laughs> what people argue is that basic scientific laws and the basic physical constants, such as the um, force of gravitational attraction, uh, the speed of light, and so on, if they'd been even slightly different, the Big Bang would not have led to the, the, the emergence of our universe.